Let's pray together. Lord, once again, as we come to this place, we ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. For, Lord, you're our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have a, um, currently, I have a dysfunctional barbecue grill, and it makes me sad. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was changing to a different propane tank, and it was full, and I hooked up the new tank and tried to turn on the grill, and it wouldn't turn on. And I was in a hurry, and I didn't have time to diagnose it or figure it out, and I haven't had time since. So, so for two weeks, it has sat there, sadly, uh, not being able to grill burgers or chicken or anything else. It sits in the backyard, dysfunctional. Dysfunctional is a long word for it ain't working, okay? Now, the word dysfunctional or dysfunction entered the English language in 1914 as a medical term, uh, as in this person has a dysfunctional kidney, this person has a dysfunctional liver. It was a medical term for a part of your body that wasn't working. But for the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so, it has been increasingly applied to other situations. It's been applied to families. This is a dysfunctional family. It's been applied to workplaces or schools that are not working. They're dysfunctional. It's been applied to political systems. It's even been applied to churches. It, it, it really has just come to mean a system of people that isn't working, that isn't working right, that, that there's, it's not functioning correctly. It's dysfunctional. This group of people is, is not, it's, it's broken somehow. And we've all had to deal with dysfunctional systems. Groups of people that don't seem to be able to get along or work together or, or even kind of tolerate each other. And sometimes when we find ourselves in a dysfunctional system, we say that following God can be challenging, it can be hard. It may seem very difficult to function, especially as a follower of Jesus, when you're in the middle of a dysfunctional system, when you're in the middle of people that are not being able to, to work together or even live together. So over the next few weeks, I want to talk about how do we walk with God, how do we follow Jesus in the middle of some kind of dysfunction. And what I want to do is see how someone in the Bible did it, and that someone is Joseph. Joseph is going to be our guide to how did he deal with multiple dysfunctional systems. How did, he, how did he survive? How did he even thrive dealing with lots of dysfunction in lots of areas of his life? The story of Joseph is found in chapters 37 through 50 in the book of Genesis. And Joseph really is a guide through how do you, how do you walk with God when you're surrounded by dysfunction? And we're going to start today by seeing a dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional family. And Joseph's family really takes the cake in that department. It, it is an incredibly dysfunctional family that we see in the book of Genesis. Let's think about his dad. Joseph's dad was Jacob. And Jacob is, frankly, a kind of a shady character. His name, Jacob, means grabber. And that, right off the bat, tells you something about his character. He was always grabbing at things for himself. He's a twin. Jacob has a twin brother, Esau. His brother Esau was born first. Even though they're twins, somebody has to be born first. Esau was born first, so he is the older brother. But Jacob cheated his brother twice. Once, when his brother Esau came back from a hunting trip and was starving, famished, uh, Jacob had made some stew, and Esau says, can I have some? He says, yeah, you can have a bowl of stew if you give me your birthright as the eldest son. And Esau foolishly sold his rights as the eldest for a bowl of, for a bowl of stew. Jacob tricked him out of it. Then when their father Isaac was on his deathbed and was about to give the blessing to Esau as the eldest son, Jacob dressed up like his brother. His brother was hairier than he was and told his dying father that he was Esau, even though he was Jacob, and stole the blessing from his father. So he's a slippery character. He's a grabber. He's a usurper. So that's Joseph's dad, Jacob. 
Now, Jacob ends up becoming better than the grabber he is in his early years. He has an encounter with God. Um, he wrestles with God um, in the middle of the desert. And, and what that really means, how literally he wrestles with God emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, he, he wrestles with God. And at the end of the night of wrestling with God, God says, I'm going to give you a different name, not be grabber anymore. He gives him the new name, Israel. Israel, which means wrestle with God. So he, he gets a little bit better, but he still has this sort of shady aspect to his personality. Back when he was running away from Esau, because after he mistreated his twin brother so badly, Esau says, I'm going to kill you as soon as our dad dies. I'm going to wait until dad dies, and then I'm going to kill you. So he's running from his twin brother. He goes to hide out with his uncle, his mom's brother, Laban, and works there for several years for his uncle. And he falls in love with his cousin, Rachel, and wants to marry her. And his uncle says, okay, you can marry your cousin, Rachel, if you work for me for seven years. Anyway, he does that, and on the wedding day, here comes the bride all veiled up, and they get married, and they go into the tent, and it's not Rachel. It's her older sister, Leah. His uncle has tricked him into marrying the older sister instead of the one he's in love with. But now they're married, and he has to work even more for his uncle to get the one he wanted in the first place. And so he marries both sisters, Rachel and Leah. Then Rachel and Leah get into a contest to who can have the most babies. And they bring their maids in to start having babies on their behalf. And so Jacob ends up with two more wives that are the maids of the sisters, Bilhah and Zilpah. So he's having kids with four different wives at the same time. And you thought modern families were messed up, and you thought modern families were complicated. He has four wives at the same time. Here's a chart, okay? All right, there's, there's Jacob. There's Leah and her servant, Zilpah, and Rachel and her servant, Bilhah, and the 12 sons that they produce. It is a complicated family tree. So if Joseph was having to do a report for school on my family, okay, he had a father, he had a mother, he had three stepmothers, he had ten half-brothers, and one full brother. Okay, and you think your family tree is maybe a little difficult to explain or complex. This could be a, one of those reality shows, you know, about, you know, the real housewives of Judea or whatever. And, you know, anyway, it's a messed up situation. And it's even more messed up because Joseph's mother, his actual mother, Rachel, was his father's favorite of the four wives. He's the one he fell in love with, the one he wanted most. And so she was the clear favorite wife. She dies in childbirth, giving birth to Joseph's little brother, Benjamin. So Joseph and Benjamin are the two youngest of the twelve. And because they are the youngest and because they are the two sons of his favorite wife, they are the clear favorite sons. And Jacob is very obvious that he loves those two boys more than the other ten. He plays favorites very blatantly that those two boys are the favorites. And because Joseph is his favorite son, he makes Joseph a special coat. Now, the old King James says it called it a coat of many colors. Most modern translations don't just say it was a special coat or a coat with long sleeves or an ornate robe. Broadway musical calls it Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. Um, and jazz it up a little bit, but it was basically, it was if Joseph was walking around with a t-shirt that says, I am the favorite child. <laughs> I'm the favorite child. He's walking around with this coat that screams, Dad loves me the best and more than any of you guys. Now, given all that background, let's hear from the Living Bible what we read earlier, just a little bit more modern language. 
This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Remember, these are the two maids that get into this baby contest. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob made him a special gift, made for Joseph a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. These, just these three verses there, Genesis 37, 2 through 4, tell us a whole lot about this family's dysfunction. There is blatant favoritism. Blatant favoritism that is generational. Because Jacob had been his mother's favorite. His twin brother Esau had been his father's favorite. And they were very blatant about playing favorites in that way. His grandfather... Abraham loved his son Isaac much more than his son Ishmael. So this idea of playing favorites in the family is generational in this family, in this dysfunctional family. Now all of that led 17-year-old Jake, uh, 17-year-old Joseph to having a little bit of an attitude. Because in this little passage we just read Joseph is 17, his brothers are almost all grown men with wives and families and kids, probably at least 30 years old, if not older. And so they're working, and their 17-year-old kid brother comes up and sees that they're goofing off and goes back to the dad and says, yeah, they're goofing off. They're not doing a good job. Now, that, you know, most grown men in their 30s or even early 40s do not like being told what to do by a 17-year-old. I'm sorry, but they don't. <laughs> most, most men, if they, had, if they were in their mid-30s and they had a boss who was 17, would find that difficult to be underneath that person. So they, they really chafe under this. Matter of fact, they chafe under it so bad that they're filled with jealousy that leads to rage, <laughs> that leads to thoughts of murder, And, spoiler alert, we'll talk more about this, but they end up throwing Joseph in a well, in a cistern, a dry well, and then selling him as a slave, selling him into slavery. After they sell their kid brother into slavery, they go back to their father Jacob, and they got the the colored coat that they've ripped off of him. They've killed a goat and covered the coat with goat's blood, They bring the coat back to Jacob and say, yeah, we found your son's coat all covered with blood. He's dead. And they tell Jacob that Joseph has been attacked by a wild animal, that he's dead. And here's the proof. And it says Jacob was never the same after hearing the news that his favorite son had been killed by an animal. Of course, it wasn't true, but Jacob's never the same. He says he mourned the rest of his life because of that. Now, again, this sounds like one of those horrible reality shows, you know, about a horribly dysfunctional family. I mean, this makes the Cardassians look like Leave it to Beaver. It makes it look like the Brady Bunch. Um, Most family drama does not go this far. (laughs) But every family has some drama. Every family has some things that don't work. You know, there are no perfect families. There's no such thing as a perfect family. You know, especially as I've over now almost 37 years as a pastor, been with a lot of families at some of those stress points like weddings and funerals and things like that. And you see kind of families close up and you realize there's no such thing as a perfect family. There aren't any out there. You know, but dysfunctional is kind of another step. I mean, dysfunctional really means this, this system is totally broken. This system just is not working at all. You know, my car got a little Toyota RAV4. The handle of the glove compartment is broken off. 
I got a little bit too um, enthusiastic one day, and I just broke the handle right off the glove compartment. So the glove compartment will not open, and I haven't been able to open it in years. And I asked for how much would it cost to get a new one, and it was several hundred dollars. I'm like, well, forget that. So I don't know what's in the glove compartment. Apparently, I haven't needed it in several years uh, because I haven't been able to open it in several years. And whatever's in there, well, it's just going to be in there until I sell the car. But so that it, it's broken, but the car still works. It does not make the car unusable. So do I have a dysfunctional car? No, I have a car that just has you know, a couple of little problems. Well, most families, you know, have something, you know, have some things wrong, but most families are not dysfunctional. But Joseph has a dysfunctional family. And what can we learn from this dysfunctional family? Well, maybe first we can learn that playing favorites always leads to resentment. Playing favorites always leads to resentment. It's okay to have your favorite movie, or your favorite TV show, or your favorite flavor of, of snow cone, but not your favorite child. <laughs> because, and, and not just like when they're little kids, and oh, you know, he got more ice cream than me, or things like that. I mean, I've seen families where brothers and sisters hold grudges against each other for their whole lives over the favoritism of their parents. Families where brothers and sisters who are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old won't speak to each other because their parents played favorites when they were little kids. Families that, that have horrible walls because of favoritism. See, children have an inherent sense of fairness and fair play and justice. And if they perceive that parents play favorites... It, it, can, it can lay a trap that will literally impact the family, not just for the rest of their lives, but for generations. It can be a generational thing. God loves all of His children equally. You know, God loves every person that He's created in their mother's womb. Back in the book of Acts, we talked about this a few months back. In the book of Acts, Peter is sleeping on the roof, of a friend's house, and he gets a vision of all these non-kosher animals that Jews weren't supposed to eat, and the vision says, go ahead and eat them. And Peter's like, oh, oh, no, I know better than that. And then a messenger comes and says, there's a Roman soldier that wants you to come to his house and tell him the gospel. And Peter's like, well, I know I'm not supposed to go to a Gentile house, because Jews were told, don't go to a Gentile house, don't talk to Gentiles, don't talk to non-Jewish people, ever, ever, ever. But here this vision comes saying, don't call something unclean that God has made. And so Peter goes to the house of this guy who's a Roman soldier. And his whole family and friends are in this house. And Peter walks in, which a Jew wasn't supposed to do. And they all, this Roman soldier has been hearing from God and loving God. And the whole family is hungry to hear about Jesus. And when Peter sees that, he says this, Acts 10, 34. Peter replied, I see very clear that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, He accepts those who fear Him and do what's right. In other words, God doesn't play favorites. God loves all children. Now, not every child loves Him back. But God loves all of His children. God doesn't play favorites. Our Heavenly Father doesn't play favorites. Neither should earthly fathers and mothers whether the kids are 5 or 15 or 65. Because I've seen 65-year-old siblings that are still mad about what their parents did, even though their parents are dead. So favoritism contributes to dysfunction. Now, Joseph is the hero of this whole story, but he's not perfect. He's a good guy, but he's not perfect. He likes being the favorite. He likes the special coat. What 17-year-old wouldn't like feeling superior to his 30 and 40 year old brothers. So there's pride in that. Pride is at the root of so much destructive, unhealthy behavior. Now just like playing favorites can be a good thing with snow cones or movies, pride can be a good thing. If you're pr proud of your country, you're proud of your family, proud of the work you do. I mean, pride, in a, there's a good kind of pride. 
There's a, there's a healthy pride that we have, but there's also a destructive pride, a pride that is puffed up, a pride that looks down on other people, a pride that mocks other people, a pride that belittles other people, a, a pride that sees other people as inferior, you know, and, and Joseph, it's hard for him to avoid that when he's a teenager and he's being shown all this favoritism. But pride, pride's deadly. The wrong kind of pride. Peter, the same Peter who went into the Roman soldier's house, wrote a letter, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 5 says this. Peter says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. You know, you know, we, you know, we tend to, we are, we're called to respect people who have more experience and more, live more years than us. Uh, to show respect to older people. But all of us, whatever your age, it says clothe yourselves with humility, to be humble. Um, you know, and that just, you know, that doesn't mean we, we are going, oh, I'm terrible, I'm awful. No, it, it just means that we don't put ourselves above other people. We don't look down on other people. We don't puff ourselves up to the, you know, to the detriment of other people. You know, pride leads to all kinds of things. It led to the, you know, pride and it, it leads to almost any sin that you can think of. In some ways, there's a connection to pride, you know. That's why Paul talks about having the same attitude that, that Jesus had, which was he's the Son of God, and yet he lowered himself to be a servant. You know, Philippians 2 talks about how Jesus lowered himself to serve. And, and Paul says, have that attitude. So in this dysfunctional family of Joseph's, you know, we see favoritism, we see some pride, but the biggest problem in this family really is jealousy. Jealousy is what leads these older brothers to consider murdering their little brother. Instead, they only sell him into slavery, which is better than killing him, but still a pretty brutal thing to do to your brother, to sell him as a slave. Then lying to their father about it. And it says, Jacob is never the same when he believes Joseph's been killed. Jealousy destroys this family. And again, over my years as a pastor, I've seen jealousy really destroy families, you know, and it's usually, it comes out, uh, sadly, it comes out at, sometimes at happy times like weddings, or it comes out at sad times like funerals when families are kind of mushed together and there's deadlines and stresses, and I've seen, you know, people who should know better, people who are older than me, um, argue about who gets a knickknack. You know, when the parent dies, argue about who gets to sit where at a funeral or a wedding. And it's all based in jealousy. It's all based in jealousy. There, there are sisters and brothers who haven't spoken to each other in 30 and 40 years. Why? Because of jealousy. Jealousy's deadly. Paul says this to the church in Corinth. And they had some problems in Corinth. And he said to the people in Corinth, you're still worldly. Since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? You say, well, what do, what do you mean? We're all human. Yeah, we're all human. He, when he says mere humans, he means acting like the rest of the world who don't know Jesus. He says, I expect the rest of the world to be jealous and quarreling and mean and selfish and all that. He says, but you're followers of Jesus. You should live differently. You know, if there's jealousy and quarreling among you in the church in Corinth, that's, that's no witness to people outside the church. Why should they come to church if you act that way to each other just like the rest of the world? As he says, you're worldly. You're, your walk with Christ hasn't changed you from the people who don't know Christ. You, know, you need to be different. We need to be different. We need to be different. Now, given that Joseph is raised in this incredibly dysfunctional family, given the way his brothers mistreated him, you might expect that Joseph became an angry, vengeful, broken man. You might think that he would live his life in self-pity or that he lived his life thirsty for revenge, 
thirsty to get back at those men, those brothers who wronged him, or that he simply withered up and died, or that he fell into the patterns of his father and grandfather. But we're going to see, as we read through his story in Genesis, he doesn't. He doesn't live as an angry man. He doesn't live lusting for revenge. He, he, he doesn't just wither up and die. He, he, he doesn't live, he doesn't let all of that change him into a bitter, angry man. Why not? How is he able to make a different choice? How is he able to make it, given his upbringing, given given where he came from, how is he able to make different choices? Well, maybe a quote from a man named Viktor Frankl will help. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian man. He was a psychiatrist and a neurologist. He happened to be Jewish, though. And because he was Jewish, in 1942, he and his pregnant wife were taken to a Nazi concentration camp. He and his extended family were all put in a Nazi concentration camp where his father died of starvation. Then he and the rest of the family were transferred to Auschwitz in Poland. I've had the, say, privilege, just the unique opportunity uh, when we were in Poland to visit Auschwitz. It, it is a horrible place. It's an important place, but you can go to Auschwitz in Poland and see the living conditions that prisoners uh, were totally no hygiene, excrement and filth and vomit on ev all the bunks. And I mean, it, 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 it's horrendous. And every, every shred of human kindness and decency taken away. It, it is a nightmare place. It's an important place that I'm glad you can still go and hear the Holocaust story. But Auschwitz is a horrible place. And so he and his family were sent to Auschwitz where his mother and his brothers were all put in the gas chambers. Where his wife died of typhus. But he survived. Viktor Frankl survived. And after, he, after the war, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's because of that, he has a quote from that book that I think might explain how Joseph was able to not become a broken, bitter, vengeful man. Frank, Victor Frankl said this, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Everything can be taken from a man, and, and he experienced that in Auschwitz. Everything was taken from him. Everything. His family, his dignity, his ability to even control, you know, his hygiene. E everything was taken from him. But he says, everything can be taken from you except for one thing, your ability to choose your attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Now, I know in our church and in every church, there are some people who, you know, some of you grew up in families that were like a, a TV sitcom from the 1960s. You know, everything was pretty great all the time. Some of you grew up in situations or are growing up in situations that are not great, that are not great at all. Some people in our church have grown up in dysfunctional families. And this is not to discount that experience. This is not to say that that you can just shake that off or ignore that. It, it causes deep wounds. It, it, it impacts if you've grown up in a dysfunctional family, if you've grown up with abuse or alcoholism or, um, you know, the things that, that just make a childhood awful. I mean, I'm not to discount any of that. But we look at Joseph, and he grew up with brothers who hated him, who were going to kill him, who were going to sell him into slavery, a household filled with jealousy and dysfunction, and yet we're going to see he, he chose to, to walk with God anyway. He chose to walk with God anyway. 
you know, because as Frankl says, the one freedom we always have is the freedom to choose how we respond to anything and how we choose our attitude, how we choose how we live. Doesn't say it's easy, but with Christ, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. You know, that quote is often kind of misused, as I've said. It's not a quote that's mainly about, we can win the game. No, it's about how we're dealing with pain and suffering. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's the context of that quote. And I believe it's true. In Christ, we can do all things. Even in difficult situations, we can do all things. Let's pray. Lord, we, um, we come again asking that you would continue to help us uh, in whatever situation we're in, whether we're feeling on top of the world or feel like we're kind of crawling through the valley. <laughs> Most of us are somewhere in between, but wherever we are, we want to walk with you. <laughs> and if we're crawling, we want you to pick us up and carry us along. And, and Lord, whatever's going on in our lives, in our families, in our jobs, in our relationships, with our friends, um, if things are great or things are not great, um, we want to walk with you and we want to choose to follow you and choose to have the attitude of Christ, an attitude of compassion and love and mercy, of fairness and, and loving others the way we want to be loved. And all these things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.